work in. Oh. Unbelievable. A <laughs> um, little bit about my background. I have, I've been doing it for 30 years, pretty much my entire career, like, like Phil said, and I've, I've worked on different sides. I've worked with utility companies the first oh, 15 years or so, uh, helping them with their uh, pro programs, developing uh, energy management projects, and, and doing a lot of energy audits. That, that seems to have been a theme all along, as is, is lots of energy audits. Uh, probably I've done, I've done thousands of them. So. Um, worked in the private sector the second half of the 30, uh, 30 years and also with the State Energy Office. I was under contract with them uh, as a consultant for their rebuild program um, for about eight years. So right now I'm with a nonprofit called Michigan Green, and Michigan Green is, is the green stands for Group for a Renewable Energy Efficient Nation. It's very much geared towards getting energy efficiency and renewable energy done, not just educating, but helping people get these things accomplished. Because we can audit buildings all day long and provides all kinds of, of neat analysis, but if at the end of the day, if things don't get done, if energy measures aren't implemented, then uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's all for naught. You know, we need to actually implement and, and, and make energy efficiency happen and save energy. When that happens, um, a lot of good things happen. Uh, the, the title of this is Energy Audits and Energy Efficiency, Your Best Investment and Easiest Way to Improve Your Bottom Line. Those, those two things will occur. And then, of course, the third thing is the environmental uh, impact. It's anytime we can save energy, uh, especially if it's electricity, natural gas, um, fossil fuel type uh, energy fuels, we're going to uh, improve the environment by using less of those. Uh, if we can reduce power plant emissions, there's all kinds of good things that, that happen and, uh, for the environment. So we see energy efficiency as a very green technology, obviously, and renewable energy is, is a, a big part of it, too. But we're going to focus on energy efficiency today. Um, in the statement, your best investment and easiest way to improve your bottom line, we're talking to business people. So that's, this is what this is geared towards. Um, and best investment, uh, in my opinion, yes. Uh, and I guess before I get started, I would be curious as to what everybody thinks a really good investment is. If we're talking about re rate of return, return on investment, stock market, I think you know, the average over time is 10%. Um, what would be a, a really good investment? Something above 10%. 15, 20? What would you guys consider to be a, an excellent investment, a, a great re uh, return on your investment? 27.3%. <laughs> Okay, that's what we'll shoot for. We need to beat 27.3%. Um, what I'm going to do is, is to illustrate what can happen um, is to use an example. It's, it's a real life example, um, actually a UP example. This is a, a restaurant in the UP that we're going to take as an example. Uh, pretty typical. Uh, most of the lighting in the restaurant is, is incandescent. It's it was almost entirely all these 60 watt light bulbs. And we had 60 of them, approximately. There are actually a few more than that, but we'll go with 60, be conservative. Uh, the restaurant's open 75 hours a week. Actually, it was about 70, 72, and then some extra time for cleanup and prep. We go with 75 hours. That's very conservative. I don't know if there's any restaurant owners in the room, but that's a very conservative number of hours. It's normally closer to 90, 100 hours a week. So we'll be conservative, go with 60, 60 watt incandescent bulbs at 75 hours a week. If you do the math, that comes out to 14,000 kilowatt hours a year for that lighting application. And what we're going to look at is replacing all of these with the compact fluorescent technology. And most of you are probably familiar with, with these lamps as, as far as being compact fluorescent. But there's all kinds of different shapes and sizes of these lamps. Um, this is only one thing that was used. And in fact, in this example, the only place we used these coil type was up in the, the chandeliers where they're not seen. Um, <laughs> unless you really like the, the shape of these, and some people do. It's kind of an industrial techno look. Um, I tend to like to hide them. So we put them up in the chandeliers for the lights hanging over the booths. We went with these globe type ones, a little nicer looking. 
And then up in the ceiling area, where you've got these recessed lights, we went with a reflector type, so which is really the right technology. They actually had light bulbs up in those, and a lot of that light gets trapped up in that fixture. This gets it out of there. You know, here's some good example. These are polished, but we've got incandescent up in there. Light bulb, same thing. Now with these, it's okay because it has a polished reflector. You could actually get away with using either one of these types, and that would work great. But in our example, we used those three types. We replaced all 60 of them with 15 watt compact fluorescent lamps. Uh, the investment would be the cost for doing that. $8 a piece was about an average. They actually average in price anywhere from about $5 up to, to $10. Uh, we went with $8 for a conservative uh, number here. $500 is the cost. That's our investment. Energy savings, those 15 compact fluorescent lamps at 75 hours a week, it, it calculates out to 3,500 kilowatt hours a year, 10,500 kilowatt hour year savings. Got nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour, which around here is a really good rate. Up there it was the average. Um, what we saw in the business, the small business audits that we did in the Grand Rapids area was closer to 12 or 13 cents a kilowatt hour. So this is a very, very conservative number. And that amounts to, uh, when you calculate it out, about a thousand dollar a year savings for this particular uh, measure. So the return on our investment is a thousand dollars a year. The payback, everybody's always looking at payback. How quickly will it pay for itself in energy savings? Uh, and in this case, five hundred dollars cost with a thousand dollar payback or a thousand dollar savings. Excuse me. We'll give you about a half a year payback. Six months, it pays for itself. One thing that's really important with any type of measure that you do, you always want to look at the life cycle of the measure. You can, uh, if you look strictly at payback, you can come across measures that might pay for themselves for three or four years, that's great, but if it only has a service life of two years, it's not such a great deal. You know, it, it never even pays for itself. Uh, in this case, looking at the service life, um, these particular lamps were rated anywhere from 8,000 to 10,000 hours. Uh, we went with 8,000 in this example to be conservative. You take 75 hours a year times 52, that's 3,900 hours a year divided into 8,000 hours. So it's a little more than two years. We'll call it two years even for the, uh, the service life of this. So we've got an investment of $500, a return on that investment of $1,000 a year, and a service life of two years. And what we can do is take that data. Um, I've got a chart here that I, I took from the uh, EPA Energy Star Guide for Small Businesses, which is a wonderful uh, text that's out there. And what this table does is gives you an idea of, of what the rate of return is, the internal rate of return for different energy efficiency measures. Once you know the simple payback, which we know it was 0 0.5 years on this particular example, and you know the service life, which we found that to be two years, 173% is our rate of return. Well, that beats 27.3. <laughs> and, and honestly, I've had people say, well, that's a really extreme example. I actually use conservative numbers. There are a lot of other different low-cost <laughs> technologies like that where you get these kinds of returns on investment. You start getting into things like uh, major equipment replacement, high-efficiency boilers, furnaces, um, you're not getting 173% return on your investment. You are getting a return on your investment, though. Uh, and, and sometimes it can be 15, 20%, even for those high ticket items. So um, I really do believe it is the best investment. Um, just by, you know, this, this example gives you a good idea, but there are others. Um, the other thing that I said, the easy, easiest way to improve your bottom line, and we're talking about profitability. Uh, one of the things with utility costs is that the cost of those come right off your bottom line, right off your, your profit. So if we can impact that with energy savings, it's going to positively impact your, your bottom line. And I'm going to read this. Uh, I apologize, but I, there's too much there to, to memorize that one. Um, the National Restaurant Association, and we're going to stick with our example here and carry it through. The National Restaurant Association reports that the average restaurant typically spends approximately 2% of its revenue on energy approximately 4% of revenue becomes profit. 
If a business owner reduces energy costs by 20 percent, so that'd be going from 2 percent down to 1.6 percent, the total bottom line in profit increases from 4 percent to 4.4 percent of revenue. So that 0.4 percent then gets added right on top of the profit. And this increase in profit is the same as a 10 percent increase in sales, uh, in other words. So let's put it in a little bit better format. Again, let's take our example. The savings or the return was $1,000 a year. And we can take that and use another one of these nice charts that EPA Energy Star has provided. And what this chart will show is the equivalent annual increase in sales necessary to match your energy efficiency measure. And you need to know the annual savings, which for this one it was $1,000 a year, and the profit as a percentage of sales. For our restaurant uh, example, it was 4%. And so we go look at the chart at $25,000. And what that means is to, to match the energy efficiency savings provided by this, this simple compact fluorescent lamp measure, you'd have to increase your sales by $25,000 a year. And we did it actually for what? $500. So for $500, which comes out to $10 a week, we increased sales equivalently by $25,000. And if you can increase sales by $25,000 for 10 bucks a week, that's, that's a pretty good deal. You'd be hard pressed to find another way to do that. But it's even better than that when you think about it because in the example, the lamps had a two year life cycle. You spread that over two years, it's really $5 a week. So for a $5 a week cost, you're increasing your sales by $25,000 a year for two years. So it's a, an excellent way to increase your bottom line. And I've, I've got a lot of different types of examples like that. I could go back to that. If, for example, 10% is the, is the percentage uh, for profit, which is fairly common, it's still a $10,000 increase in sales to match the energy efficiency. And you can do the arithmetic any way you cut it. It's a very easy way, a one-time cost. You get it done, and it improves your bottom line for the next two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, depending on the service life of the, of the measure that you do. So it's a a real easy way and effective way to increase profitability. And then the third kicker is the uh, environmental impact. I touched on that. Anytime you can reduce energy use, you're going to uh, create a positive environmental impact. And we'll, we'll use the same example and, and, and take a look at what that means. Um, we had 10,500 kilowatt year, hours a year of, of savings for this example. We're in EPA Region 5, so that's where these numbers are coming from, from the EPA as far as what will 10,500 kilowatt hour a year savings mean in terms of reduced power plant emissions? Less electricity having to be generated. Well, in this region, it means 18,900 pounds per year of CO2 emissions will be prevented. It also means that 240 pounds per year of SO2 emissions will be prevented, and 81 pounds per year of NOx emissions will be prevented. Um, bottom line, positive environmental impact. You can compare it to, uh, EPA likes to use a lot of these word pictures to, to bring the point home. And in this case, this, this simple compact fluorescent lamp measure would be equivalent to planting 52 new trees every year. And where they, they get that, um, that's always one of the questions I get is how do they come up with, with something like that? Um, we know that an average tree will absorb or process about 330 pounds of carbon dioxide a year. So where this number comes from is 330 divided into that number, 18,900, and you end up with 57. So it's, what they're saying is it's, it's the same thing uh, in terms of processing carbon dioxide. You can either prevent it or 57 new trees can be planted to uh, uh, absorb and process it. So it's positive environmental impact. Um, and I would be reticent uh, talking about environmental impact if I didn't touch on compact fluorescent lamps, because there is a, a certain, um, we call it hysteria uh, in the business for these, because they, there is mercury in these compact fluorescent lamps. And there's a concern uh, um, by a lot of people and some groups that, um, that these have mercury in them, and it's a hazardous substance. What I would like to point out is that the amount of mercury in one of these things is very, very small. In fact, it's about the size, if you took a ballpoint pen, just that little ball on the tip of the pen, that's about how much mercury is in one of these. And you would need to gather over 100 of these to collect enough mercury as what's in one thermometer. So it's not a tremendous amount, 
Um, it becomes vaporized once this thing starts up uh, anyway. This is an interesting stat here that I think really drives the point home and, and takes care of the argument. A coal-fired power plant releases into the atmosphere four times the amount of mercury as what's inside here to provide the electricity for one incandescent light bulb. And that's putting four times the amount of mercury into the atmosphere. The mercury is contained in here. Um, if you recycle burned out CFLs, it's not going to get into the atmosphere. It's going to be handled properly, um, so it's contained. Uh, to, to simplify that, as we get asked, well, how, what do you do with these? How do you recycle them? Usually recycling centers will take these, but Home Depot now is doing a national campaign. They have been for the last year, and they will take burned out CFLs, so you can drop them off there. There's no charge, and that's an easy way to, to dispose of them. Um, doesn't need to be any, any fear about using compact fluorescent lamps. It's a much more environmental friendly alternative than incandescent lamps, in fact. So, mm -hmm. yes? They're not. Well, we have Home Depots. <laughs> <laughs> So there, there are alternatives. Um, if, if you break one, that's another concern. If you, if you drop one and break one, essentially um, the procedure now is just to double bag it in plastic and throw it away. It would be better to go to recycle it, but once it's broken, um, I don't know if the recycling centers really want, want them. I don't, I don't know whether Home Depot does either. I can't tell you that for sure. But you, you can bag it and uh, put double bag it in plastic, throw it away. Um, I've broken them before, and it's not like, if you read some of the uh, procedures that are out there, they'll tell you to open windows up and air out the room, and, and you know, I, I just, like I say, I've handled them before, and I, and I don't have that fear. I mean, if you have fillings in your mouth, you've got mercury amalgam in your mouth, so you probably have more mercury in your mouth than you're ever going to, you know, run into with, with all of these, so, that you would use, so, it's a good, safe alternative. Why energy audits? Uh, what's the point? Uh, well, obviously, we believe it's the first step to saving energy in your facility, and we think it's a very important um, aspect of it because nowadays, I mean, we've been doing these for 30 years, and the utility companies were really uh, pushing them a number of years ago uh, before they got out of that, that business. And, and honestly, and we did thousands of them, but honestly, I think they're more important today than they've ever been because there's so much technology out there now. It's changed so much over the last 10, 15 years, especially on the lighting side. Um, a tremendous number of, of options. And so they need to be looked at, and, and I will say that not all of them are cost effective. It's very helpful to have somebody who's familiar with all the technologies and can, can give you an idea for your specific situation. You know, is it cost effective? Um, you know, if something can save 40%, that's great, but if it's a, a technology that's only used five hours a week, it's probably not going to be a, a great uh, cost-effective measure to do. So the energy audit uh, provides focus direction, helps you find your way through the maze here to the energy savings, and it helps prioritize measures uh, that you can do uh, that are cost-effective and uh, gives you a plan to work, save energy at your facility. Typical savings measures with energy audits, uh, lighting measures are huge. Uh, as I said, that's, that's changed tremendously in the last, really over the last 30 years, over the last 10 to 15 years, it's changed even more. It seems to be accelerating every year. There's new technologies coming out all the time. And we look at you know, some of the technologies, T8, T5, I'll get a little more into that, compact fluorescent, LED exit signs, occupancy sensors to control lights. Typically, 20 to 50% savings is possible with, with lighting measures. Uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning upgrades, and that can be high efficiency boilers, furnaces, infrared heaters for garage and warehouse areas, uh, energy management systems, even clock thermostats, uh, different controls for boilers, variable frequency drives for pumps, air handlers. There's, there's lots of options on that side too, 10 to 40 percent savings, typically possible. Domestic hot water, uh, tankless water heaters is probably the biggest uh, technology that we're seeing being implemented. They work really well, especially for commercial applications and businesses. Residential, tankless water heaters, kind of expensive. They have to be sized properly. You usually need a pretty good size one for a residential application. For business, 
Uh, normally not the case. You can get by with the, the smaller systems. They're pretty cost effective um, and work well. Uh, tank, pipe, insulation, timers, 5 to 30 percent savings with uh, domestic hot water. And then there is a whole slew of, of low cost measures that can be done. Water conservation, a lot of those fall into that camp. Uh, some no cost things like building temperature adjustments, operation and maintenance items, um, 10 to 15 percent savings, very uh, typical. So that gives you kind of a, uh, a menu of, of what we're looking at. Normally when we do an energy audit, when you walk in the door, there's over 100 different uh, measures, technologies, applications that we would be looking for. We start narrowing it down real fast, of course, but um, tremendous number of options. And I thought it would be good to go through uh, one of the questions that came up was what kind of things were we recommending in the MSU Rebuild Michigan Extension uh, program. And so what I did was I went back through the, the 10 different audits we did and compiled a list and put together what I call the top 10 list. And it's, it's by frequency of recommendation, not necessarily by cost effectiveness, but what were we recommending most often when we uh, did these energy audits. So let's go through that list. The first one, number 10, was programmable thermostats. And that was kind of a surprise. Normally programmable thermostats are in the top 5%. But what that tells me is that uh, business owners understand that it does save energy to turn down the heat at night to shut off air conditioning. Um, so we found that being done on a regular basis, uh, and I would say much more so than in the residential sec sector. So um, I think business owners pretty much understand that there's good savings available, usually 10, 15 to 25 percent uh, if you're not doing any type of a setback. Programmable thermostats make it real easy because it's automatic. We looked at uh, outdoor lighting upgrades. And that could have been anything from just replacing uh, incandescent light bulbs by porch, uh, in porch lights with, with the compact fluorescent technology. It could have been uh, putting timers. It could have been putting photo cells on lighting to control them so that they're only on uh, when it's dark. Um, and we could, even for some bigger fixtures, we might have been looking at replacing mercury vapor with, with uh, high pressure sodium metal halide, some of the other technologies out there. Um, so that was number nine. High efficiency heating systems came in at number eight, and that was primarily uh, uh, high efficiency boilers and high efficiency furnaces. I think there was a few cases where we recommended the, uh, the infrared heaters, which are very effective for garages and, and workshops and storage and warehouse facilities, very efficient. 25 to 40 percent savings, very common with, uh, with high efficiency heating systems if you're going from a standard efficiency system. Water conservation, um, actually surprised this isn't higher because that, that's something that uh, with most businesses we always recommend at, at least with the, uh, the faucet moderators for, for bathroom faucets, uh, kitchen faucets, break room faucets. Uh, these can be very effective. Uh, the, the one thing I'll say about water conservation is there, there is a lot of technology out there and there's a lot of cheap technology. Um, there's a lot of very good technology and with the savings that are possible in the, on the water conservation side, always good to go with this, the best stuff you can get because of the difference, um, and I'll pass these around. These are a couple um, flow moderators for faucets, and you can see just by the, the weight, these are put together really well. I mean, these are NeoPearl, I think they're 1.0 and 1.5. Typical faucet uses two gallons per minute, um, so those reduce anywhere from 25 to 50 percent, but they're just they're going to last a long time. And they only cost like three bucks a piece. You can go out and buy the cheaper ones for 50 cents or a buck. Three bucks, you buy the really good ones, and they're going to last and perform a lot better. So it's always a good idea um, to do that. There's things in the, uh, in the restrooms, if they're institutional type, um, toilets, urinals, they can be fitted. The valves can be fitted with these, these little things. They save, uh, I don't know, like a quarter to a half a gallon per flush. Um, they only cost 10, 20 bucks a piece. So they're, I don't know, they pay for themselves in a matter of months. So. For restaurants, this is a great one. Uh, most restaurants have a, what's called a pre-rent sprayer that they, they use to spray off dishes before they go into a dishwasher. Most of those sprayers use anywhere from three to six gallons per minute. I've actually measured some of them at six gallons per minute. This uses 1.6, and it performs better in tests than the uh, 
and the, the higher volume ones do simply because the pressure on this thing is, is fabulous. And one of the things you'll notice, I'll pass this around, is single orifice. The key to a lot of this water conservation stuff is, is the pressure. If you're going to reduce the amount of water output, you've got to kick the pressure up to, to perform. And so it's just all of that water is coming out of one single orifice, but at a very high pressure, and it's, it's very effective. And again, you can feel the, the weight of it. I mean, this, this stuff is, uh, you can buy cheap ones, but the, it's worth it to spend uh, a little extra and get the, the high quality stuff, because you will get 10, 12 years use out of those. And then shower heads, not so much for uh, uh, commercial businesses, things like hotels, motels. Uh, the, the hospitality industry would use these, but uh, here's a couple examples of uh, one and a half gallon per minute. These are both uh, aerated type shower heads, and you notice they both have a single orifice that the water comes out of. And so it's a, it's a very high pressure aerated spray. Uh, I've been using that one for over 10 years. And we had seven people in our family, and everybody uh, accepted it readily. It wasn't a problem. Um, first time you use it, it scares you a little bit because it sounds, <laughs> you know, they're not real quiet. They're, they're pushing a lot of water through there, but uh, the savings are amazing. So, and you save on the energy side with a lot of this stuff, too. If you're saving hot water, you're saving energy, too. So it's um, not just water conservation. Um, water conservation is very important energy-wise at the municipal level. It's extremely expensive to, to filter, to pump water, to distribute it to the, around the city, to treat the, the waste stream. Um, there's a huge energy component to water conservation that we don't see at the residential level or at the business level that the city knows all about. And having worked with municipalities in the rebuild program for eight years, wastewater treatment plants and water filtration plants are about the two biggest energy using uh, facilities per square foot that I ever ran into. I couldn't even chart them because they'd be way off the charts and the other buildings would hardly show up. So it's, uh, to me, it's a very important component of, of energy savings. Water heater replacements, again, that's primarily talking about the tankless water heaters where those come into play. 20 to 30% savings, typical with those. Occupancy sensors um, to control lighting. Typically 20 to 50% savings, and I'm using uh, EPA numbers on that because it varies. It depends on, on the, the facility, depends on the application. Uh, restrooms, if the lights are on all the time, you're going to be up over the 50%. Uh, offices with sporadic occupancy might be closer to 20%. Uh, it is going to vary according to the application, but that's a technology that's come a long ways and they're very effective uh, for controlling lighting now and we recommend them. Number four was compact fluorescent lamps. I don't know if anything's changed as much in the lighting industry as compacts. There are so many options out there now. And I'll pass some of these out because they look, they're very interesting. I mean, like I say, most people are familiar with a, with the Curly Q uh, spiral type compact. The globes are very nice. The uh, reflector lamps, um, these are you know, fairly typical applications. Yeah, I'll send these this way. A newer type of compact called the cold cathode is uh, kind of the next, next gen. Uh, these are relatively new within the last few years. Uh, unfortunately, they, they only come in sizes up to 8 watts now, and they're getting uh, more and more powerful as we go. But at 8 watts, you're really only going to replace uh, up to 40 watts of uh, incandescent lighting. So they are for specific applications. Uh, but I'll pass around. Just, I, I just think it's neat technology. These are, I think all three of these are five watt ones. Um, even these small candelabra flame tips are available now. You can replace incandescents with these. What's cool about the cold cathodes is uh, most of this technology is dimmable. So where you run into trouble with the old compact fluorescents, that's no longer an issue with these. You can dim them. They cost a little more, but they last 25,000 hours. So they last about three times longer. And typical, typical compacts, 20 to 30 times longer than incandescent. Um, really neat technology. Cogged V-belts. I couldn't find my, my uh, visual aid for that. Uh, a cogged V-belt is a, if you think of a fan belt, most of them are V-shaped, smooth. A cogged V-belt just has little notches all the way around it. And those notches, uh, 
reduce slip. It, it increases the efficiency of whatever piece of equipment is being used, whether it's an air handler in a furnace, uh, air compressor, refrigeration compressor, uh, those types of things um, where you replace fan belts. Three to five percent efficiency increase. They cost a little more. They last longer. It's, it's a real easy one that, uh, you know, and what I, what I tell people is if you need to get a fan belt changed in your furnace or whatever, just ask the guy, you know, are you going to put in a cog one? You know, one of the ones with the notches. They're more efficient. Um, and that's a good time to do it is that replacement. Adjust heating cooling temperatures was number two. Um, and that's generally talking about existing temperatures in the building, not dialing down at night. We're, we're, we recommend 68 degrees as the uh, temperature in the workplace for heating, uh, <laughs> 78 for cooling, which is a really good goal. I, I don't find that too often. It's usually 75, 76 is, is pretty good. Um, but the savings are quite good. Is it, it just, if you can reduce the heating temp or increase the cooling temp, even one degree, two degrees, the savings are, are pretty decent, five to 25 percent savings just by really keeping a, a handle on temperatures. And the audits that we did, a lot of this came, uh, applies to certain specific areas. We found areas where, uh, like storage areas that were 70 degrees and, and were separately uh, uh, controlled by a thermostat. Those areas can be dial down to 55, 60 degrees commonly, you know, 60 easily. So that's really what this number two was getting at was specific areas and buildings where the temperatures could be adjusted, uh, usually up or, up or down depending on the, the season. But uh, that's a no cost, low cost one that's easy to do. And then number one, and it has been for probably 15 years, is, is T8 fluorescent lighting. We still see a lot of T12 fluorescent lighting out there. Um, Everybody heard those terms before, T12, T8 lighting. Um, probably in a commercial uh, circumstance uh, situation, this is a good example. You know, the four foot uh, fluorescent lamp is, is probably the most widely used lamp. Um, you go residential, the 60 watt incandescent. You go commercial, it's the four foot fluorescent lamp. This is, this is not four feet, of course. but uh, it's an example of a T12. And what those numbers mean, just a real quick education on that. The T stands for tubular. It's the shape of the lamp. The 12 is the diameter of the lamp in eighths of an inch. So a T12 lamp would be 12 eighths of an inch in diameter or one and a half inches in diameter. So that's what that means. And these, uh, typically you use a 40, uh, a four foot one typically uses 40 watts. If it's energy efficient, it uses 34. The T8 is the, the newer technology, and uh, being T8, it's tubular, 8 eighths of an inch, it's one inch in diameter, so it's, you can usually tell real quick if the lamps are fat or skinny, you know if it's high efficiency. These in here are T8 lamps. Uh, they've been uh, retrofitted, they might have been original, I don't know, but they're, it's T8 technology, and typically when you go from T12 to T8, you save 30 to 40 percent, and it really depends on if you have two lamps in the fixture, or three or four lamps in the fixture as to uh, what the savings become. Uh, that does require, it's not as simple as just taking the T12 lamps out and, and replacing it with the T8 lamps. You have to replace the ballast, and need a special electronic ballast, and then the T8 lamps. But regular fixtures, if you have nice fixtures, these are real nice fixtures, for example. If it was T12 technology, We'd recommend just retrofitting them. Go with new ballasts, new lamps, upgraded to T8. Um, you know, with three three lamps in here, it'd probably be about 35% savings if they were going from T12 to, to T8. So, we still see an awful lot of that. The newest technology is the T5, which is a real skinny one, five eighths of an inch in diameter, primarily for specific applications. It doesn't come in four foot lengths. Uh, it comes in 54 inch lengths. It, it's actually metric lengths. Um, so they don't fit regular fixtures. You have to replace the entire fixture with this technology. Very bright. The, the smaller you get these lamps, the brighter they become. And the good thing about that is with different fl uh, reflectors, you can uh, direct that light better and, and more efficiently. Um, these are very effective, primarily warehouses, uh, gymnasiums, high ceiling areas because they're, like I say, they're extremely bright. And uh, in a work environment, in most cases, they're going to be too bright, obnoxiously bright. So, 
And that's the top 10. Now, um, does anybody have any questions? Any technologies at all? Questions about any technologies, anything you've been thinking about? Um, that's pretty much what we found. There were some specific applications for sp specific businesses, obviously, that I didn't mention. Uh, these are just the common ones. Yeah, yeah. The only thing you have to do with a T8 is you do have to replace the ballast. Um, I've actually seen cases where people actually just replace the lamps and one of the T8s, but the ballast is either going to have trouble with that and burn out, or the lamps are not going to last. I mean, and it's not, and you're not going to get the same energy savings. It's it's a combination of the ballast and the lamp that makes it happen. Um, if you've got nice fixtures, that's the way I would go. It's a it's a pretty easy retrofit. Um, if they're just the real simple surface mount type fixtures. I just replace the whole fixture because you can get them with the ballast and lamps in them already, and it's it's typically cheaper just to replace uh, an inexpensive inexpensive fixture with a T8 fixture. But yes, sir. Halogens are pretty tough to beat for a situation where you really want a lot of heat off the lamp. I, I don't know if the fluorescence will ever, um, you know, that's a difficult, difficult one for me to, to answer. Um, yeah, I, I, the LED, I, I don't see that being something that, that will be able to replace those very easily. The LED actually works, works uh, you know, very good in cold environments. And as they get warmer and hot, they lose efficiency. Um, I didn't talk about LEDs. That's probably the biggest surprise in this whole thing is that uh, LED exit signs were not mentioned. That's something we've regularly recommended just about everywhere we go for the last 10 years. And most of the businesses um, that we visited already had done that. So that was, that was actually a nice, uh, a nice surprise. Uh, LED technology is, has come a, a long ways. That's one of those technologies that's it's improving extremely fast every day. I used to tell people it was five years away before we started replacing these types of uh, fluorescent lamps with LED. And uh, I, I think we're looking at a couple of years at this point, not five anymore. It's, a lot of it has been the light uh, color. You mentioned the uh, color uh, temperature. And, and that's always been a problem with LEDs, especially on the white side. They tend to be almost a bluish color. And they're working hard to improve that. Uh, but that's a good point about the color temp, even with compact fluorescence. Um, I always tell people, you know, if you if you tried a compact fluorescent, you didn't like it because it was too bright or harsh, or you, you didn't like that. They come in so many different color temperatures now. For every application, you can find a, a compact fluorescent that will mimic incandescent. And normally, for your uses for table lamps, uh, task lighting, you're going to look for a warm type uh, compact fluorescent. Uh, you'll actually get a little little bit better. Uh, visual acuity with a, with, a, with a cold or a cooler temp, uh, but people just find it kind of a harsh uh, environment. So the, the warm ones, um, and, and you'll see, when you go out, and if you start researching this, looking at this, you'll see they're, they're um, measured by degrees Kelvin. They'll be 2700K, 3100K, and, and uh, the warm is actually on the lower end of the spectrum. You think the higher you go, that'd be warmer yet, but that's not the way it works. That measurement of color temperature if you think of a piece of metal being heated up extremely hot, it'll first get red hot. It'll get extremely red hot. It'll start getting into the, the white and the blue range. And that's what it's really measuring with these color temperatures. When you say 2700K, um, that's what a, the metal that they use for the test would be glowing at, at 2700 degrees Kelvin. So the warmer lamps are actually on the lower end of the temperature spectrum, spectrum which it's kind of confusing, but you just remember 2700K or warm white. Uh, those are the types of, of lamps you probably want to look at in terms of being able to, to use comfortably. 
Um, in business and most commercial applications, it's going to be a cool white is what they go with. It's just the most common, and it's, it provides very good light. Um, but uh, another thing I didn't mention with the TH2 is a lot of people are, are bothered by the, the lighting of, uh, of fluorescent lighting, and it can have to do with the ballast. Uh, the older ballasts are magnetic, and there can be just a little bit of flicker um, that you can't see, but uh, your body can detect it. I didn't used to believe that. I, I had a friend who's been in uh, the environmental and, and the, uh, um, the healthy side of buildings for a while, and he used to tell me that. And the tests have proven him to be right, is that uh, uh, especially certain people are very sensitive to that. So a lot of times when you go to the T8 technology, you will eliminate those problems. The ballast fires a lamp at a much uh, higher frequency, takes away the flicker. Uh, they're closer to full spectrum lighting. They provide a much better uh, color in rendering uh, index than uh, the older fluorescent. So um, it was real common for me when I worked with the schools with Rebuild um, to go into a situation where they'd done a T8 retrofit. And the savings were great, but what they would really be happy about was the environment. They just felt that it was a so much better environment for the kids, for staff, and that's what they commented on. It's just the quality of light so much better with this, you know, and then and the 40% savings is a nice side benefit too, but um, you know, that's some of the side benefits of most of these technologies now is when you replace them, you, you upgrade, you save energy, but you also improve the quality of, of, of the light, of, of, of the water, of the, you can increase comfort in the building with some of the controls and save energy. Uh, there's usually additional benefits, and we talk about that in an energy audit, um, that you gain by doing these measures. So, any other? Yeah. I have a question for you about high efficiency heating systems. Can you talk a little bit about what's out there in terms of the market for small business and whether or not anything's moving? Right, for small businesses, I generally see, um, I'll tell you the toughest one is. The rooftop heating systems, heating and cooling systems, those are probably the most common commercial heating system out there. And there hasn't been that much improvement, and, and I don't know why, but there hasn't been that much improvement over the last 30 years. They're a little more efficient, but you don't see, uh, and, and I don't get it because the furnace component in there, it's really not different than uh, the high efficiency 97% efficient furnaces. You know, why that component can't be added to that system, I, I've never quite understood why. but. If it's a rooftop system, um, limited efficiency increase with replacement. If it's a furnace uh, or a boiler system, and it's a hot water boiler system, uh, the efficiency gains can be very, uh, you know, very tremendous, um, closer to the 40%, really. And a standard furnace, up to a high efficiency furnace, a standard boiler system, especially if it's older, up to a high efficiency boiler, you can get close to that 40% uh, savings with those. So. Uh, the other thing would be uh, that, that we see quite often, if it's a business that has a garage, uh, warehouse area, typically those are heated with hanging unit heaters, which is really nothing more than just a forced air furnace hanging from the ceiling or the wall. And the, uh, the infrared type heaters, uh, some people call them tube heaters, but um, essentially it's just uh, impelling hot gas you know, through a burner and it runs through the tube and it's reflected, it's a reflective type heat, it's, it's quite efficient. And normally, if you go from those hanging unit heaters in garages, warehouses, storage areas to the infrareds, uh, 25, 30 percent savings are very possible with those. And those are pretty cost effective. So the one thing I will say on, on, on those, those are probably, when we talked about uh, return on investment, those are a larger investment required. The savings are good, but they're not as cost effective as the easy measures. Uh, but I think what will be changing very near in the near future here is the utility companies are getting back into the game again, and there's going to be rebates and incentives available to, to help bring the cost of these systems down, and, uh, and that obviously will impact the, the payback and the cost effectiveness in a big way. So that, that's we're a matter of months away from that happening, and that will uh, change things for the bigger the bigger ticket measures like that. So. What about, are there noticeable savings regarding the electronic devices? Um, <coughs> computers and fax machines and, and those type of things run it? The, the savings can, yeah, the savings on those can be, be 15, 20% pretty easily. Um, 
what we generally recommend for that is to look at Energy Star rated equipment. Most office equipment now, uh, they do rate with Energy Star. You pay a little bit more, but the savings will pay for that uh, incremental cost pretty quickly. Um, things like computer monitors going from the, uh, the older uh, technology to the LCD screens, it's a, it's a good savings with that. Um, the computers themselves and printers and faxes, they're all, they've all come out with uh, Energy Star models now. And that's, that's a real easy way to, um, to look for, for good uh, technology to buy. Um, and actually bring, bringing that up, uh, one of the things that I would recommend if you are looking at compact fluorescent technology is, and it's very tiny here, but look for the Energy Star uh, indicator on, on the box. If you purchase a compact fluorescent lamp and it's Energy Star rated for a commercial application or business, that's guaranteed for a year. If it's got that Energy Star label on it and it burns out after 10 months, you can return it to where you got it and they'll give you a free one. They're required to do that. That's the Energy Star label. That's a requirement. In a residential, it's two years. So I typically, at home, what I do, when I put one of these in, I actually take a black magic marker and write the date on it that I put it in. I save the box. I mean, these are one of the boxes that I save because if, if they burn out um, and it's in that time frame, you take it back, they have to replace it if it's Energy Star rated. So always look for that label. Four, four foot T8s. Uh, how long does that bulb have to be off to really save yourself? Does it take more to fire them up? These up than does it's more a, a frequency of, of of the cycle that that will. Um, yeah, I, I, to me, it's if it's going to be the, the general rule used to be that if you're going to leave a room for 15 minutes. Shut the lights off. Now we just we recommend just shut. The, if you're leaving a room, shut the lights off. Occupancy sensors. Normally they'll give you a uh, anywhere from two to five minutes before they they shut off. But uh, I can tell you that the service life of lamps for a fluorescent lamps and most of them are rated at twenty thousand hours, twenty four thousand hours. If we're talking the four foot tube lamps, um, that's based on a three hour cycle. So if the lights are on, off, on, off, uh, you know you're, you're probably not going to get twenty thousand hours use out of it. Um, if they're on all the time, you'll probably go well beyond that. So that's, that's just a general, the average you know, service life of those lamps is based on a three hour cycle like that. Um, to get back to your question uh, with occupancy sensors, you know, in most circumstances, unless it's a, a situation where people are in and out, in and out, lights are just on and off and on and off all the time, and, and we don't see that that often. Um, you know, I recommend using them as much as possible, and the savings add up pretty quick on those. You know, normally 20% is is the minimum um, in the EPA reports that I've seen. The minimum that you're going to get savings with just utilizing those occupancy sensors, and of course they can get a lot higher than that. So we recommend it, and they've gotten a lot better. I mean, there were some problems uh, 10, 15 years ago, and some complaints on the, how well they performed, but. Uh, you know, we're at a situation now with a lot of the occupancy sensors you'll be seeing, um, they won't even be wired anymore. It's, it's going to be wireless technology um, for those. It's already out there, but it'll be you know, more widespread in the next four or five years. So that's control is a, is a big area of where it's all going. The better you control the energy you're using, the more you can save. And uh, they're coming out every day with better and better controls. So.